Howdy y'all, I'm Michael Kaminsky, co-founder of Recast, and today I am excited to announce the launch of GeoLift by Recast as a standalone product with a six month free trial. That means unlimited incrementality tests with no restrictions. Why do this? Our mission at Recast has always been to make good causal inference methods available to marketers and business people everywhere. GeoLift by Recast accomplishes this with a simple yet powerful platform for designing and analyzing geographic-based incrementality tests. The platform has been designed by our amazing team of data scientists and statisticians to help marketing teams kickstart their incrementality testing programs. In the platform, you can design clear, rigorous incrementality tests in less than 15 minutes. You can measure the incremental impact of online and offline media channels, and you can run unlimited tests. No PhDs or complex setups required. We believe every marketing team should have access to powerful causal inference methods, and GeoLift by Recast is our way of achieving this. So let's jump into the tool and I'll walk you through exactly how to design and analyze your own experiments. GeoLift by Recast allows you to design and analyze super robust incrementality tests with a simple, easy to use interface. Today, GeoLift by Recast uses what is known as a synthetic control method to power the underlying statistics. In our docs, you can read more about the specifics of the augmented synthetic control method, which was developed by professors at Harvard and UC Berkeley. We're gonna start with analyzing an experiment that's already been run, so that's pretty straightforward and will help you understand what the synthetic control method is doing under the hood. So to start, what we're going to do is we're gonna load in our data set. And this is a data set of basically our sales by geography by day going back into history. So you should be able to pull this out of your data warehouse or even the Shopify reporting system and load this directly into Recast. The structure of the CSV is pretty straightforward. We can see it here. We've got one column for location, one column for our outcome variable, whatever that is. It could be revenue, it could be net revenue, it could be new number of new conversions, it could be number of orders, right? Whatever that KPI variable is, if it's in the CSV, GeoLift by Recast can analyze it. And then the last column is the date. Right, and so we can just see we have one row per date here, January 6th, January 7th, January 8th, January 9th, et cetera. And if we come down here, we can see that we also have this for other geographies. So we were looking at New York, now we're seeing St. Paul. This is the complete history of the number of sales in all of our different geographies going back in time. So now we need to tell Recast a little bit about what's in our CSV file. So we've got a date column, we've got a revenue column, we've got a location column, and this is the date format that our data is using. So I'm just gonna ingest data. Here we can see a little visualization of what are the sales like in all of our geographies going back in time, or at least a sample of our geographies going back in time. This is showing eight out of the 40 geographies that were in the CSV file. Here we can see there's some seasonality, right? Maybe monthly or weekly seasonality. These are these little peaks, but overall everything was good. So we were able to load this in successfully. Next, we have to tell the tool about the test that we run. So here, I know that we ran a test that went from March 1st to March 22nd, and then it has a cool down period going to the end of the data, so through April 4th. And we ran this test in Austin, Boston, and Denver, right? So these were the three geographies that we ran the test in. Here it's loaded in. If we have a more complex test with lots of different geographies, sometimes it can be annoying to have to type these all in. So if you have just the test geographies in a CSV, you can load that in here. If we need to exclude any geographies from the analysis, maybe because there was something strange going on in those geographies, right? We know that they were confounded. So let's imagine that we know that in Baton Rouge, you know, there was a hurricane that impacted sales. And so we want to exclude that from the control geographies because we know that there was weird stuff happening there. And then just to get the units right, we have to tell it what sort of variable this is. This is a revenue variable. And here we increase spend in these geographies by $15,000 during the time of the test. Then we're gonna hit the analyze experiment button. And in just a second, this is gonna come back with the results of the experiment. Here we go. This is the results. So we have an estimated lift in revenue of about $33,000. So that's a 9% total lift. Recast clearly shows you the confidence interval here, which is really nice. So the lift estimate is consistent with Revenue increases ranging from $14,000 to $37,500. Statistically significant, at least at the 90% level. The estimated midpoint of the incremental ROI is 2.2x, and the confidence interval is 0.95 to 2.5x. So here we go. Now we can see a breakdown of what was actually the results of the test. So we have the total revenue in the treatment geographies, the geographies Austin, Boston, and Denver. We have the modeled control, 
which has the estimate of $364,000. And then we have the lift of about $33,000. And then here we can see the results of the experiment or the results of the synthetic control method. And so what we have here is we have a yellow region, which is the region of the test. So this was days 56 to day 78 in our data. And then we have the cool down period, right, which is shown here. And the way that I like to think about this is what the method is really doing, right, is it's looking to look at the test revenue. So this is the amount of sales that we had in Boston, Austin, and Denver during this time period. And then what it's going to do is it's going to create a set of control geographies that are weighted so that they really line up well with the test geographies, right? And that we can see is the gray line. We can see that there's really good fit here during the pre-period before the actual experiment was run. And then once we get into the test period and the cool down period, we look and we see, did the test geographies actually have more sales than those modeled control geographies? And that's what we see here, right? And we can see that, you know, on some days for sure, we definitely had way more sales. And cumulatively, right, over the period of the experiment, we can see that the sales were consistently above the control geographies in terms of the amount of additional sales that they generated. So that's all present here. And if we want to get insight into what combination of control geographies best match our treatment geographies, we can see that here. And so in order to match Austin, Boston, and Denver, we can see here that the method says, okay, well, we need about 22% Jacksonville, 21% Dallas, 13.5% New Orleans, 12% Los Angeles, 11% Cincinnati, et cetera, for all of these different geographies. And this weighted combination of potential control geographies is what gives us the modeled line here and the modeled estimate of revenue here, which is what allows us to estimate the lift associated with this treatment. Now that we've seen how to analyze an experiment, now we can flip over and actually design the next experiment that we want to run. So things start off the same, right? We're going to load in data that we have about our historic sales and all of our different geographies. And again, we just have to tell Recast a little bit about what's actually in our data. We ingest it, we see that everything looks good. And now we have to configure our design or configure the analysis of the experiment that we want to run. And the thing that you need to keep in mind is that designing an experiment can be tricky because there's a couple of different things that we want to solve for, right? We want to learn as much as we can as efficiently as possible. So we want to try to design an experiment that requires sort of the lowest amount of investment for the largest amount of learnings. And the idea of a power analysis or an experimental design exercise is to try to do that. And so we have a bunch of choices that we need to make as we're thinking about, okay, how do we want to think about how big of an experiment we need to run versus how much that's going to cost us. So we can do a design, let's say, where we want to design decreasing or eliminating spin in an existing channel. The outcome is revenue. Here we have to put in the approximate channel ROI. And here we want this to be as conservative as possible. And so if you already have an idea of what the true incremental ROI of this channel is, you can plug that in here. But often you want to put like the bottom of that range. So if you ran an experiment in the past and it gave you results with an uncertainty range from 3x to 6x, you probably want to power this to detect a lift of 3x, right? Because that makes this analysis more conservative. Or if you have an idea just internally, strategically, you know, hey, look, you know, we're willing to invest in channels as long as they have an ROI of at least 1.5x, right? Then that sort of floor is really what you want to use to try to power the experiment that you're going to run. So I'm going to plug in one and a half X here. Let's do a three week experiment, right? And see what comes out. And then we'll do a seven day cooldown period. And here we're going to say, okay, we're going to turn off, all right, we're willing to turn off $15,000 total across all of the different geographies that we're working in. If there are certain markets that we, you know, know that we need to include in this experiment, right? We know, you know, for some reason, Cleveland, we definitely want to turn off our marketing spend in that region. We'll include that for sure. If there's something going on in some other region that we want to make sure that isn't being included in the test arm, Nashville, right? There's something special going on over there. We want to make sure that we exclude that. Or if we want to exclude something completely like San Diego, we don't want it involved in this experiment at all, either from the test side or from the control side, we can specify that here. And we can select the range of geos that we want to consider, right? Anything from two to about half, which is 20. I'm just going to let this try to do it this smart way. So I'm going to hit generate test markets and we're going to see what comes back. Okay. So here we have a bunch of different 
candidate experiments. And this is basically showing us that we could run an experiment in Cleveland and Milwaukee, or Cleveland and San Antonio, or Baltimore, Chicago, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Dallas, Honolulu, Jacksonville, Memphis, Milwaukee, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is that these are all different possible experiments. And what Recast has done behind the scenes is it has run a bunch of simulated experiments, right? Where it goes back in time and it says, okay, what if we actually ran an experiment in these geographies? And what if it actually had some certain amount of lift? How good would this experimental design do at actually correctly estimating that that lift was real? And so here we can see the results of that simulation exercise where we simulated a $22,500 negative lift. We estimated something right around that. So it had a very low error. That's great. Similar simulated lift size, a little bit more error, right? And we can see that here. And so this is basically just sorted and saying, okay, what are the different possible experiments we could run? And they're different estimated lift sizes. And then among these experiments, we can choose which one we want to look at to do a deep dive. So I'm going to choose Cleveland and Milwaukee, and we're going to do a deep dive with this particular experiment design. And we're going to see how well powered it is, right? Once we do even more simulations, do we get back good consistent results that this experiment is well powered? Um, and it seems that we do. And so I'm going to come down and look at this power curve. And basically what this is showing us is showing us that different levels of spin changes, right? Ranging from $0 in spin change up to $30,000 in spin change. How often are we correctly estimating a statistically significant lift? And here basically it's saying that as long as we remove at least 5,000 total dollars from these geographies, we should be able to get a statistically significant lift as long as the true ROI is at least the one and a half X threshold that we put in. So that's great. Here we can see a simulated example. When we do a simulation with no effect, which is to say like we run the experiment, we do a true AA test, right? We do the experiment analysis when there is no true effect. And here we see that the method gives us an estimate of a basically zero lift, right? This is not statistically significant, so that's good that the model correctly tells us that there is no lift when there is actually no lift. And here we can see the simulation when we simulate a 5.2% decrease in the test regions. And here we see that the model correctly estimates an $11,000 decrement in the total amount of lift, which is correct. Right, and here we can see that this gives us the result that we want. And so this simulation exercise helps build confidence that when there is no lift, we correctly estimate that there's no lift, and that when there is lift, we correctly estimate that there is lift. And that's what the results of this experiment are showing us.